social inequities um, and how our system contributes to inequities in society and most of my work focuses on racial and ethnic inequities some of it focuses on socioeconomic uh, and class inequities um, but all of the inequities that people in our field study I use in my work um, a second area is the study of diverse populations and I've spent a lot of time excavating the voices of marginalized populations um, and much of that time focusing on populations that have been uh, extremely visible and visible in our field like Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, multiracial populations, uh, first generation college students. Um, and then the third area is an institu institutional context. So uh, the study of campus culture, and structure, and how that shapes the experiences of people um, at institutions of higher education. And I usually like to point out that these things are all um, sort of interconnected and influence one another. So our understanding of social inequities helps us better understand the experiences of diverse populations 
and our institutions, but the voices of diverse populations also inform our understanding of larger inequities, <coughs> as well as what our institutions are not doing so well or are doing really well. Um, and that will all be reflected in the talk as I go through uh, the research that we're doing. A couple things about the approach. So I, I take the approach of critiquing dominant theories and narratives because I think that, um, like many people in our field, that we've often relied on theories, models, frameworks, uh, research that's been constructed for specific populations that does not apply to marginalized communities. Um, and that can be useful sometimes, but a lot of times it can also be problematic. Um, second approach is centering marginalized voices, um, which is related to the third approach, which is generating new perspectives. I, I highly value um, using research to generate models and frameworks and perspectives that can then provide tools for other people to study things that we, uh, interests that we have in common. Right? Um, so I'm going to focus on this area of college student success so that you can see some of those ideas and how they played out on my agenda. Um, in the area of student success, but for the higher ed folks in the room and maybe some non-higher ed folks, you are probably aware that uh, we have a few dominant theories and frameworks that are used in our field or have been used in our field for decades. Uh, they're listed here. Uh, and I'm not going to go through them in deep detail, but essentially uh, they suggest that students' levels of integration into involvement in or engagement in uh, different activities and opportunities on college campuses determines their level of success, or their likelihood of success. Um, now, these theories and perspectives have been critiqued for many reasons, and I've written more thoroughly about those critiques. Um, but there are two that I wanted to highlight. One is uh, that they, the first two, the integration and involvement theories, have been critiqued for shifting the focus away from the institution to the student and sort of suggesting that there's an assumption that the student is responsible for their own success. If they do get involved, they're going to be successful. If they don't, they're not going to be so successful. Uh, but in effect, it shifted the focus away from the institution and centering the conversation on what the institution should be doing in order to provide optimal environments for students to be connected and to succeed. Um, and then all three of these frameworks have been critiqued for their, uh, their lack of meaningful engagement of diversity um, and diverse identities and cultures into uh, the theory and the discourse around the theory that has emerged. So after uh, those theories were proposed, there's been several scholars who have conducted research, a handful of them listed here, uh, that have generated what I refer to sometimes as conceptual divergences. They've diverged from the more traditional ways of thinking about student success and proposed concepts like cultural validation, which suggests that uh, if you have environments, programs, curricula, practices that validate the identities that students from which students come, they're going to be more likely to succeed. So shifts the responsibility of the institution. Um, and then there's several others. But a few years ago, I was thinking about all this research, and I was observing on a regular basis the reality that people on the ground who were having conversations about institutional change and increasing success among diverse populations kept falling back on these three dominant frameworks for multiple reasons probably, uh, one of them being that they still dominated theory and research and discourse on student success. So I said, we have to do something different. And one of the things that I concluded was one potential reason that this kept happening was that we didn't have like a comprehensive holistic framework that explained or tried to explain student success 
that meaningfully incorporate a diversity, right? So we needed one of those. Uh, so I generated this CC framework, uh, which I'm going to share with you in a minute. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of context um, regarding the underlying uh, thinking or philosophy of the framework. So when I generated this framework, I did it based on all of the research that had been conducted on diverse populations over the last say, two to three decades. Uh, I also based it on interviews that we had conducted across several studies. And the handout that I'm going to share with you, it says 170 interviews. That's with students. Um, but there were also like 30 interviews with administrators and staff and faculty. Um, now we've conducted close to a thousand interviews uh, in various research and assessment projects uh, over the last decade. By we, I mean my research team and I uh, have conducted close to a thousand interviews in order to uh, further examine and extend the work that's reflected in the framework and then also explore how these environments are being constructed in different spaces in higher ed. The framework accounts for those perspectives I shared and the critiques as well as the conceptual divergences and the insights that have been offered um, through those. Uh, it shifts the focus not completely but primarily on to the institution um, and their responsibility to construct environments that are more inclusive and more empowering for diverse populations. It approaches the understanding and the study of student success from an anti-deficit perspective and I think when we use that word it's often used when we think about individuals like viewing students of color from an anti-deficit perspective. Here I'm using that when thinking about institutions uh, and, and conveying that you know we often talk about the challenges that exist at institutions which is important. Um, we have very real environment climate challenges um, but the model was meant to fill the void of discourse on what institutions can and should be doing in order to create more positive environments for diverse populations. And then it integrates diversity and success. So one of the things that I'm always thinking about is how can my research be applicable and accessible to the work of practitioners. Um, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to do with the generation of the framework was have some kind of model that prevented people from being able to relegate diversity conversations to the chief diversity officer on campus or the multicultural center by integrating discourse about success and discourse about diversity and inclusion. So I'm going to pass out this handout. It's just a one-page handout. Um, um, and I'll, I'll provide a very brief overview of the framework. I'm not going to go into detail on every indicator. We'll have the definitions uh, in front of you with the handout. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the whole model, which is much more complex for the sake of time. I'm just going to focus on a couple of critical parts. So this part um, is the nine indicators of what the model suggests are an optimally inclusive environment. Um, and this first set of the nine, because it can be broken down into two subcategories, uh, are the five indicators that have to do with cultural relevance. And the way I usually talk about relevance is uh, it is the degree to which a campus environment is relevant to the identities and the communities of the students who are enrolled there. And there are things like, do people have opportunities to connect with individuals on campus who understand and share their backgrounds? Do they have opportunities to learn and learn about? and conduct service that is aimed toward giving back to their communities? Um, do they have space to engage in meaningful dialogue with people from different cultures around solving real social and political problems? And do they have environments that validate their identities and make them feel valued? Uh, the second set 
I refer to as cultural responsiveness or four indicators of cultural responsiveness, and they have to do with the degree to which campus support systems take into account the different values and norms of diverse populations and then integrate them into the design and the delivery of support systems. Um, and these have to do with things like are there uh, collectivist cultures on campus that are teamwork based, collaboration based? Um, are there proactive philosophies that lead practitioners or educators in general to not just have information and resources available, but proactively take an extra step to make sure that students know what those resources are, or even pressure them to take advantage of them sometimes. Um, is there holistic support available? Uh, meaning, can students identify a person that will help them solve their problem, regardless of what that problem might be, uh, or find the person who can solve their problem? And then, um, are there humanized environments where people can develop meaningful relationships with faculty and staff who care about them and are committed to their success? Um, yeah. So we've had a good conversation about like how do we think or define culture and there's a good divide among the small. So I was wondering if you can help me understand how are you thinking about culture in this context? Yes. So we so I'm going to talk about the survey that's been generated um, from the, the model, so I can talk about it kind of in the context of that, but I'll say first that our, our thinking and conversations about culture are constantly evolving based on feedback that we're getting and assessments that we're doing uh, of the survey um, and of institutions. Uh, but in the survey that I'm going to talk about, we, we actually allow people to define cultural community themselves. Um, so we give them a prompt at the beginning of the survey that says, uh, you know, we, we recognize that cultural community or community can be defined in many ways. It can be a racial or ethnic community, uh, a church community, a neighborhood that you grew up in. Uh, but we want you to think about the communities that you most saliently identify with. We don't use salient. That was fun. But, uh, but we let them define it and then we ask them to write in a box how they define it. Um, and then we say, you know, as you're answering this first set of questions, we want you to keep those significant communities in mind. Um, and so people define cultural community in all kinds of different ways. It's race, gender, sexual orientation, uh, religion, uh, pol political communities, politics plays a role. Um, so the survey that I'm going to talk about is, I like to say it's kind of the first example I've seen of what I would consider an intersectional survey and that it allows people to consider multiple identities as their answer to questions that are relevant to their identity. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about um, the, the model uh, for another minute. Uh, one of the key aspects of the model suggests that these relationships exist, or posits that they exist. Um, that campus environments directly influence individual outcomes, so persistence, learning, development, eventual graduation. Um, that environments influence a bunch of other individual variables like self-efficacy, motivation, aspirations and expectations to persist and to complete your degree, sense of belonging, um, and then that environments indirectly influence outcomes through these variables. So the more inclusive the environment, the more positive uh, your sense of belonging, greater your motivation, etc., and then the more likely you are to succeed. So I'm going to present to you an analysis that looks specifically at an examination that fits into that framework, or that part of the framework. So what do we know about some of the concepts in the CC model and how they might influence student success. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on a few key concepts here. One is satisfaction. 
Uh, we have a lot of research that shows that satisfaction is directly positively related to persistence of graduation. Um, so Tintel's model of student integration that I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of the propositions in that model about integration influencing outcomes have found to have weak empirical evidence, but the ones that uh, some of the ones that had strong empirical evidence were related to this notion that satisfaction is important in that. Um, we have research that says that sense of belonging can impact outcomes related to persistence and degree completion, um, or intent to persist and complete a degree. Uh, and then we have some emerging a small but growing body of evidence that looks at specifically at the relationship between environments and things like adjustment to campus and belonging in the campus environment um, and shows that there is it looks like a relationship there as well but there are some limitations one is that there hasn't been much research that's looked at the model that you have in front of you and how those aspects of the environment influence belonging or satisfaction. Um, and then no studies that we know of have considered all these things together using the CC framework. So that's what I'm gonna present to you here. Uh, so the data are from six campuses. Uh, three large public research universities, one that size private research university, and two small liberal arts colleges. And, um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about all the components of the CC survey, but we generated a survey from the framework, of existing research, that measures campus environments, but also includes a bunch of other variables, demographics, high school um, experiences, and performance, living situations, employment situations, um, enrollment variables, and then a bunch of psychosocial factors and learning outcomes. Um, and I'm just going to extract a, a few of these for this, uh, for this analysis. So we sent an email out at each of these campuses with the survey initially and then did three to five follow-ups. Um, we let the institutions that were involved pick how many follow-ups we did. And, let them decide what kinds of incentives they wanted to provide. And you can see Apple is doing well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the final sample size was close to 4,000. It was a response rate of 14%, uh, which sort of immediately seems low. But when we look at the response rates that institutions get from diversity surveys, it's actually not that bad. Um, for many reasons, but um, uh, one of them being, uh, based on the assessment we've done, a lot of people would see these surveys as relevant to them. Um, and we did uh, a, sort of an examination of key demographic characteristics, mainly gender and race, to make sure that the samples were uh, generally consistent uh, proportionally with the uh, proportions reflected in the overall population, and they were. Um, so I'm going to fly through these analysis facts. If people have questions, they can, they can definitely ask them. We did a reliability analysis, which I'll present the results of in a minute. Um, we use multiple imputation to replace missing values. And then we use structural equation modeling to do the analysis. And I'm going to just say a word about why that's significant. So in a minute after this, <laughs> Um, reliability analysis results are here. Um, all of the indicators, the environmental indicators, were measured by two to six items. Um, and then these are the alpha reliability coefficients, which are between 0.89 and 0.93, which is pretty good um, if you do survey research, you'll know. Um, so this is kind of the conceptual model that drove this specific analysis. And, and here's where I'm going to explain why structural equation modeling is valuable. Right? So for people who um, do like regression analysis or um, have an understanding of that but have not been exposed as much to structural equation modeling, uh, 
you can kind of think conceptually of regression analysis as allowing you to explore the relationship between several independent variables on an outcome, right? Um, and you can examine them simultaneously to see what the unique predictive ability uh, or power is of each one of these indicators on the outcome. So how well does this predict satisfaction? <laughs> Structural equation modeling allows you to not only look at that, but also look at indirect relationships. So um, what is the influence of this independent variable on this one? And then how does that relationship maybe influence the outcome, which is in this case satisfaction? Um, so here, specific to this study, you'll see these are the five indicators of cultural relevance. Um, these are the four indicators of cultural responsiveness. Here's sense of belonging, and then here's overall satisfaction with the college experience. Um, and I didn't list out every indicator here because it just would get too messy, but, um, but I'll do that in a second in a less messy way. So, the model that we created explains 17% of the outcome, the primary outcome, which is satisfaction, which is okay. Um, explain 31% of the sense of belonging outcome, which is pretty good. And then when we look at the relationships, one of the five cultural relevance indicators was related to the outcome, to satisfaction, right? Uh, culturally relevant knowledge, if you can't see that in the back. Um, sense of belonging was related to satisfaction, and the, the effect was fairly large. These are the standardized regression coefficients. Three stars means significant at 0 .001 level. Um, and then down here, three of the indicators under the cultural responsiveness umbrella were related to satisfaction. All of these were positively related. Um, I color code things green when they're positive. <laughs> um, but one of the interesting findings of this analysis was that if we look at the indirect relationships, it tells a much more complete story. So these are all of the indicators from these two categories together. Um, and what they show is the relationship between these indicators, which are encompassed by these circles, and a sense of belonging variable. So cultural familiarity was significantly, significantly related to sense of belonging, coefficient of, standardized coefficient of 0.27. Um, cultural community service, cultural validation, collectivist orientations, holistic support, and proactive philosophies all influence sense of belonging in this model. Um, which means that they indirectly influence satisfaction um, because if all of these had their own circle, you would see eight or six variables influencing belonging and then indirectly influencing satisfaction through belonging. Um, so just a few, a few um, conclusions. So um, the analysis underscores the importance of doing more research on campus environments. Um, they clearly are important, and we always say it. Uh, I think we always acknowledge it, but um, I'm not so sure that we've done a really good job at teasing out um, or as, job, as good a job as we could do at teasing out the elements of the environment that actually lead to more positive outcomes like belonging, satisfaction, motivation, persistence. Um, there's some evidence of the utility of the framework in examining the impact of campus environments, but uh, you know this is only one of the first few analyses we've done. Um, our hope is to generate a lot more analyses and, and over the next couple of years and we're engaging researchers around the country and uh, collaborating on that so that we can create a dialogue much like was created uh, around those dominant traditional frameworks in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. 
Um, the analysis shows the power of structure of equation modeling and <coughs> identifying or, or generating an understanding of the role of mediators, like sense of belonging, um, and indirect effects of predictors on an outcome. Mm -hmm. And so there are some limitations, and I'm, I'm going to talk about those, and then how we're kind of thinking about responding or currently responding to them. So um, it was only six institutions. And we are hoping to expand this to have a much more nationally representative sample of institutions over the next couple of years. We didn't take into account predispositions. Um, so some of the research that's being conducted um, on surveys, on survey validity, is showing that when you don't have a pretest, you overestimate the effects of the independent variables that you're examining in relation to the outcome. Um, but because this was a cross-sectional survey, uh, we couldn't ask people when they got to college, what is your level of satisfaction during this first week, and then follow up with them. Uh, but what we're going to be doing is thinking about ways that we can ask retrospective questions in order to capture some of the um, and control for some of that inclination or predisposition to answer questions about satisfaction in, in certain ways. Um, we didn't look at the impact on actual persistence and degree completion. Uh, these, the surveys were conducted in this last year and a half, so we haven't really had time to follow up with people, but that's something that we're planning to do in order to capture data about actual persistence outcomes. Um, one of the things that we're going to do in the very near future is disaggregate by different groups. So the survey has variables about race, generational status, both in the US and in higher education, uh, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, and so forth. So. Um, we're going to be disaggregating and conducting analyses like this across different subgroups. Um, so, so that's it for that specific analysis. I'm going to bring it back out to the bigger picture again and talk a little bit about how this fits into the current work that our research team is doing and where it's going. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is looking at uh, how these environments are being created in different kinds of spaces and different kinds of institutions. And we have some research going on right now that's looking at how anapeses or Asian American, Native American, because of God, or certain institutions um, are cultivating these inclusive environments. Uh, and we're going to be looking at other MSIs uh, in the future. Uh, we are adapting this framework to faculty. So the framework was initially based on student data, student research, student-focused research. Uh, but we've been getting a lot of institutions saying, well, we need one of these for faculty. So uh, we have done an analysis where we took the framework and compared it to existing research on faculty diversity or the experiences of diverse faculty populations uh, in order to refine each one of the indicators so that they're more congruent with the faculty experience. And we conducted a pilot study with faculty using that revised set of indicators this year. And we're right now in the middle of doing analyses to figure out which of these indicators are not relevant, uh, which ones need to be modified or merged. Um, and this summer, we'll have a refined faculty survey and a refined CC faculty framework that can be used to study how institutions are cultivating inclusive environments for faculty. Um, keeping in line with this generation of frameworks and, and the value that I place on that, um, we have generated a framework that looks at 
culturally relevant leadership or uh, how we actually defined it or labeled it a social justice model of leadership because what we did was revised Aston's social change model of leadership which didn't explicitly enough we thought take into account issues of oppression, critical consciousness, and cultural relevance. Um, so we're starting to conduct research using that framework to shed light on leadership development and environments that cultivate that. Um, we have a study where we're generating, uh, we're, we're interviewing faculty from diverse disciplines across the country to generate some frameworks that will help faculty around the country understand how faculty are engaging culturally relevant practices in their pedagogy and curriculum. Uh, because one of the things that I keep hearing as I'm visiting campuses around the country is uh, like how does this apply to biology um, or you know I don't see the relevance of this idea of cultural relevance to philosophy. Um, so we're, we're trying to generate some tools that can be both used in research but also by faculty members who just want to begin thinking about how to make their pedagogy more culturally relevant across disciplines. And then we're, we're generating frameworks that look at data use and how institutions are using data in order to advance diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, there's been some research on this topic, but most of it has taken place outside of higher ed um, and K-12 public policy. Uh, so we're, we're taking some of the ideas and insights that have been generated from these other fields in order to apply them to the higher ed context and generate some frameworks that will help people understand how they might be able to more meaningfully engage data in their efforts to uh, advance inclusion and equity efforts. And I know um, uh, people here at USC have started to you know, create quite a bit of dialogue around data use, specifically in relation to indicators of equity. Um, but we're, we're looking at sort of how data are being used in order to for example, change the minds of people who are not invested in diversity efforts um, and inclusion efforts on campus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, we have like 20 minutes for questions and conversation. Yeah. I, just, I was curious, like, how did you select the institutions that were in that were in for, for this survey, like the, the six that, how did you choose them? So, <clears throat> so, at our institute, we have spent the last couple years setting up a system for institutions to utilize these tools as assessment tools, and then we, we provide support similar to the National Survey of Student Engagement or what um, the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA does. Last year uh, was the first time we kind of opened up the undergraduate and graduate student versions of the CC survey for institutions to register and use. And we had registration open for two months, so probably not long enough, but we had uh, 12 institutions sign up, and those six came from those 12 institutions just because data collection were completed. I see. Um, and and they're then, all predominantly white? Yes, all predominantly okay. white. Um, yeah, so it was basically one um, question that asked uh, how satisfied are you with your college experience overall. So a quick follow up to that. Yeah. So given the fact that the, that the CC framework predicts satisfaction, the implication is that satisfaction is the lever that is important to actually 
induce change or for students to succeed. Can you talk a little bit more about kind of your thinking around why why satisfaction as opposed to something else? So so I think um, yes. So to clarify, um, the the larger CC model includes a lot of variables because um, it was intended to be comprehensive. So I was kind of extracting one key outcome. Uh, but we could have done the same analysis for learning and development outcomes or um, you know, intent to persist, for example. Um, in this case, because of the evidence that suggests that satisfaction is really important in predicting persistence of degree completion, we focused on that. Um, because there's been quite a bit of studies over the last 20 to 30 years that have shown a relationship there. Uh, but I'm, I'm not suggesting that it's more important than, you know, a sense of belonging or motivation or anything like that. It's just one important outcome. Um, yeah. Were your um, participants different in any way from the population? The Students, the 14% that responded, were they at all different from the entire pop population? So we, we did an examination of uh, just a couple variables. Uh, we, it was hard to do an examination of a wide range of demographic characteristics to see how congruent they were because a lot of the categories, subcategories of students, uh, along those dimensions were really small. Um, so you couldn't really do a valid comparison. But we compared gender and race, um, and they were very close to proportional, like within 5% of each other. So um, not drastically different. Um, um, I, this is kind of an, ass an assumption, but I'm assuming that you allow the participants to kind of define what culture was to them. As when you took the survey, yes. right? Yep. So with that, um, if an institution were to see the results of the survey and, and decide to do implementation, um, how could they see these very individualized definitions of culture as generalizable as to the campus culture as a whole? Great question. So these things get messy, right? right. And um, one of the things I usually say is, We have to stop looking for easy ways to conceptualize and talk about these things, because I think that's one of the limitations of the conversations we've had. Um, but more specifically to your question, uh, I think what we, what we encourage institutions to do when we connect with them after we give them a report is to think about different ways to understand and analyze the data. So, you can look at, you know, we, we also have multiple choice demographic variables, so they can divide the sample up by those to look at how black students are in the environment compared to white students, um, you know, self-identified white students. But they also have the capacity to look at that initial question and extract people who identify with queer communities of color, for example. Um, or, uh, you know, the international students from European countries versus international students from uh, other regions of the United States, uh, of the world. So, um, so it's a complicated uh, answer, but I think the sort of response that we get is we can sort of use multiple mechanisms in order to shed additional light on a problem that is extremely complex or an issue that's extremely complex. I think there was another, yeah. Um, in the bigger project, have you found anything that's like, counterintuitive or was a surprise? Um, well, so, Not for the student survey, um, but we've been doing this for a while because I, I did a pilot survey to develop the, or pilot study to develop the survey a few years ago. Um, so this has been going on for a while. I'm trying to remember all the way back 
to the beginning. I don't recall anything that was particularly shocking. Um, I think that when we, we did our initial analyses, um, so we published an article in the Review of Higher Education, uh, I think it was earlier in 2000, or maybe it was the latter half of 2016, um, that looked at just at the ability of uh, indicators to predict belonging. Um, and what we found was that there was really strong relationships between the indicators and belonging and explained in that analysis something like 60 some percent, I think, if I recall correctly, of the belonging outcomes. So we were not shocked, but um, we didn't know it was gonna emerge and were pleasantly surprised that it was so large. Um, and then when we did the disaggregated analysis, um, at the time, we only had data that would allow us to split the, pop, the sample by white students and students of color. Now we have numbers that allow us to look at all of the different racial groups separately. But at the time, we had enough to split it into two groups, and we found that these indicators predicted belonging among white students almost as much as students of color. Um, which, I don't think we were making any assumptions, so I don't know if we were surprised, but we didn't know what was going to come out of it. Um, and often when people talk about culture or talk about community, there's an assumption that it only applies to people of color or people from marginalized populations. But my perspective now is that these things are important for everybody. It's just that some people have an easier time finding spaces like this than others. When we adapted the framework to the faculty, um, there were some surprises, but it's a little early to tell whether or not they're warranted yet. Um, we only had one institution, so we analyzed these nine indicators um, and how reliable they were for that population and found that uh, only five indicators emerged for faculty um, and have some hypotheses about why that is. The, the expectations of the kind of support you get are different for faculty than they are for students, um, is what we think, but we're still digging deeper to find out why that result emerged. Yes? So there's research that suggests that campus climate might be extending into online spaces for folks. I'm wondering if you ask any um, questions about people's online experiences and if you see the internet playing a role in the, the model. So that's a great question um, and one that we've recently started getting and I'll confess that in the initial construction of the model it was not sort of at, in the center of my mind. Um, but over the last few years we've been thinking more and more about it. Um, and we do have institutions, I can't tell you how many off the top of my head, but we have institutions that have sent the survey to online students. Um, so we know which students those are, and we're interested in seeing what the differences are. Um, now we have had some people email us and say, I'm not an online student, but I'm really interested in getting this iPad. Should I take the survey? <laughs> <laughs> but we've also had students from majority populations email us and say, this doesn't apply to me, um, even though many other students from those populations think, you know, the majority of them think that it does apply to them mm -hmm. in some way. Um, so, yeah, so it's a, if you are looking for data to do that analysis, then <laughs> we have some. I have. Yes. There was another question? Uh, I, I don't know. Were you? Uh, oh, no. Okay. So, so you, you made a reference that sometimes institutions are somewhat conservative in what they 
can measure and it's easy to measure. And I see when, when I hear you kind of like really struggling with culture and how do we measure it. And I, I agree with you that it's like by giving everyone the opportunity, you end up with a lot of conditions. And like it's difficult for the institutions to make sense of that. So I see the Nessie and I see this Sessi. And, uh, and these could be kind of complementary instruments or these could be competing instruments. So I'm just wondering if you have, how are you dealing with those? Um, that's, complex. <laughs> that's a great question. So, so at the beginning of the talk, I talked about how um, I take the approach of challenging sort of dominant paradigms and frameworks, right? Um, when we do this work, we also have to challenge a lot of other dominant, uh, systems, right? Um, so one of them is the assessment system that's emerged in the U.S. Uh, it has very concrete well-defined, developed assumptions about what good assessment is, um, even though sometimes they're based on assumptions rather than, uh, I'm not saying that Nessie's all based on assumptions, I'm saying that, um, you know, there's a set of assumptions and procedures and stuff that CC doesn't really jive with in some cases. Um, so it, it does create some tension, uh, but healthy tension. Uh, because while there is conflict, um, you know, we've, we've had a lot of conversations to figure out how data from both can be used together. Um, so just specifically to the two instruments, um, there's a lot of epistemological differences that underlie the two instruments, right? Um, we, we are doing things like the self-definition of culture that are not typically done or understood in assessment arenas as well as, you know, in, in the messy arena. Um, but my argument is that's, that's the strength of this instrument if it's used in conjunction with messy because you now have two perspectives instead of one about the college experience. Um, so we actually uh, end about the assessment process, actually. So we're, we're collaborating with um, people in Messi right now to develop. We actually have grant proposals under review, but we are pursuing projects that specifically look at how institutions can or should use both um, in order to inform their diversity and inclusion. And oh, can I just say one more thing? Well, I, I want to clarify what I was talking about, about the assessment culture and assumptions. Um, this wasn't specific to Nessie, but um, I think that there are, there are broader assumptions about what is important in assessment. And oftentimes those assumptions suggest, for example, that concrete actions that students engage in are really important because you know you, you can't really you can measure feelings and perceptions but it's you know whether or not they actually did something that matters um, and I think Nessie is kind of congruent with that way of thinking um, so we've been trying to push back on that and say well, yeah, but at the same time, I mean, it's useful to know what people are doing, but they can, you can have two students who do the exact same thing and have completely opposite experiences, depending on whether that thing was relevant to them, was inclusive, um, was perceived as offensive, or, you know, uh, not uh, in the best interest of their community um, and the people they care about. So, we're trying to sort of reshape the conversation without, you know, diminishing the importance of studying the behaviors and studying engagement, which are very important. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, Thank you for coming. Uh, I was just going to ask, so I know you said you kind of wanted to take the homeless off the students and, uh, and put it on the institution, but are there, 
being a reporter educates the institutions, are there any ways that you're telling uh, the institutions ways that they can empower the students or um, or giving giving opportunities to talk with the students to empower them to have these conversations uh, with the institution or um, in their organizations or what have you to then uh, make their campus environment better in that sense. Yeah, so we have um so I'm not a business man, person. It might sound like I am, but it's been a challenge for me to kind of move into this entrepreneurial mindset. Um, but I've done it, so uh, in order to sustain a new project. So one of the things that we did, uh, the reason why I said that is because it sounds very marketing uh, based. Uh, we develop packages so institutions can select a package <laughs> where they where we do the survey for them they get the data they get a report uh, and then they if they select certain packages they get a campus visit that's a day long that includes a series of conversations about using the data and interpreting it uh, about programming and curricula and, and what conversations start having in those arenas, um, and uh, any other things that they bring up. So we leave it a little flexible so we can tailor it to specifically where the institutions are at and what conversations are taking place at that time. Yeah. And the last question. I wonder if you could, um, oh, this is the last question, Mr. <laughs> Like, paint us a portrait of a school that has used this survey, learned something from it, uh, implemented some changes, and then, like, what, what happened? Can you sort of tell the back end a little bit? I wish I could. Okay. Um, <laughs> I get that question all the time. Yeah. Uh, but it's early, because we just launched the survey last year. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just now starting to conduct these campus visits. We do have institutions that have taken the framework yeah, yeah. Um, and integrated it. Um, and we're planning to document the outcomes of that mm -hmm. activity, but we haven't yet. But we do know that there are institutions that have made progress using the framework mm -hmm. uh, because they, you know, for example, one of our campuses that does the survey, they. Uh, have a chief diversity officer who's also the vice chancellor of student affairs who told every unit, uh, you need to be able to tell me by the end of the year how your unit has integrated these things into, the, into its practice. Uh, but that was a year-long conversation. So uh, now they're just starting to see the sort of changes that are occurring from that. And we need to go in and document it. And I only ask because I know that that can be like the messy part, you know, yeah. the exciting and difficult and um, promising part. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. So we have done work, um, uh, I know uh, Adriana and some other people have done work on the change process and we've done work on the organizational adaptation process, specifically in the context of diversity and inclusion efforts as well. So we know. We probably know, um, you know, a lot of what people are going to experience, but um, maybe not as much as we could. And, and there might be things that are specific to the utilization of this framework that we don't know. So we are planning to to document that. Thank you so much. Thank you.